Welcome to the Gym Heroes Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Peacock. Today's show is brought to you by Gymdesk, the easiest gym management software you'll ever use. Take payments, create marketing automations, track attendance, and much more. To try the software out free, go to gymdesk.com. No credit card or painful sales call required. Our hero today is D'Artagnan Bugby, one of the original dirty dozen American black belts in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We talk about how things were for him growing up in an Irish family with a fighting spirit, the early days of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and the value of fostering a radically authentic culture at the gym. Without further ado, here's D'Artagnan. Um, so what we what you were talking about just a second, or starting to get into just a second ago, um, actually, I guess this will be before that. So how did you get started in uh, martial arts originally? Oh, wow. That's, that's a long time ago. Um, well, I'm, I'm Irish and uh, first generation in America. And uh, I was boxing when I was young. And, you know, uh, I, I, I jokingly say the Irish are the Mexicans of Europe because yeah. you know, we all box. <laughs> yep. <laughs> At least in my generation, I don't know now. You know, I haven't been, I haven't been to Ireland ever since I was really young. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, started out with the boxing, and uh, and then when I was about seven, I started doing judo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've been doing judo forever, and uh, then uh, I went into karate, and I got a karate black belt. Um, and it was just like a martial arts kid, you know, that yeah. is, it was just me. That was my sport it was yeah. whatever art. I never played any team sports. I never did any of that stuff. And it was just me, you know, I had this vision in my head when I was really little, like I was a wizard and the martial arts was going to turn me into this. Mm-hmm you know, almost supernatural being, right? Like, yeah. I so remember that as a little boy, yeah. uh, having those fantasies. And, but it was really nice because it really pushed me. I pushed myself because of that. But, uh, so um, when I was about 12, I became a long distance runner. And then I ended up in high school running track and ran the mile and the two mile and I was a cross country runner. And, uh, that really set me up well for having high endurance and pain tolerance. Mm-hmm. So it was almost like I was meant to be put in pain by jujitsu, and uh, <laughs> you know, through uh, all those times. And uh, I was, uh, you know, just in LA, you know, and. I had a guy, a uh, friend of mine that I was always used to beat up, you know, and, you know, we'd rough house, whatever. And just like, he, he calls me up one day and he says, Hey man, you want to wrestle? I was like, you don't want to wrestle me. Cause you know, I had my judo. Right. And I was like, I'll kill you. What do you, what's going on? He goes, you'll find out, dude. Can I come over? I was like, yeah, come on over. Right. And he comes over and we're, we're like moving the couch. Right. I got a little space there in the in my apartment, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, you ready? And he goes, You got your your uh, gi? I was like, What? Yeah, I, you know, I've got a gi in the bedroom. What are you talking about? He goes, You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I go yeah. in my bed, I put my gi on, I come out, and he's in a gi, right? Yeah. And it's kind of hilarious. It was like some comedy, right? He's standing there in a gi with a blue belt on. And I'll go, What? the fuck is that am i allowed to cuss i'm sorry uh yeah i mean i've i don't have a rule against it particularly (laughs) (laughs) you know at that time i was like what the f is going on right yeah Um, uh and he goes you'll find out he kept saying you'll find out and i was so annoyed right so i go okay you ready because i was just gonna like body slam i'm like i don't know what this business is that he's pulling but Mm -hmm. Basically, I, you know, at that time, you know, 
I've been ju- doing judo for like ever, right? My whole yeah. life. Yeah. So I was not worried about that blue belt thing. I didn't even recognize that. I was like, I'm still going to slam. <laughs> did, the be- did it have the bar on it? The blue belt? You know, I remember because I didn't know a darn thing about jujitsu at the time. Yeah. Okay. Right. There was no recognition of that, right? Yeah. Um, it's like when you don't know what a Porsche is and someone says, was it a Porsche? And you're like, I was a car. Um, that's kind of like that. I just remember yeah. I knew wearing a judo boot and they had a blue belt on it. Yeah. So what happened next? <laughs> As, like, I was like, you ready? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, he goes, can we start on our knees? And I was like, what? Because we didn't do that in judo. You know, you start on your feet. And he goes, I go, what, are you, you know, what is this? And he goes, you'll find out. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm so done with your, you'll find out answer, right? Yeah. And he, is, and he pulls me into his guard. And so I'm like, okay. I was like, are we fighting? He's like, yeah, yeah, bro. Come on. So I said, okay. And instinctively, I just picked him up. I stood up. So I want to be on my feet. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't let go of me. So I walked him over and I started banging him on the couch. He's like, what the hell? What the hell? What are you doing? What are you doing? I was like, you'll find out. You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> And he let go with his legs, and then I slammed him on the ground, and I put him in a, in a judo hold and tortured him. <laughs> nice. And then it was kind of fun. It's kind of funny, you know? It's like, yeah. it was like such the young man, you know, like I had the bench press in my apartment, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that whole thing. And then, you know, I had our post. Uh, match confessional where he admitted that he had secretly been going down and taking lessons from boys. All right. Is is that your first, did you know about Hoist at that time or is it, was that your first uh, no, I, contact with jujitsu? Yeah. And so, you know, I just went down there with him, you know, and, uh, and at that time, all the, you know, everybody was there at the same place, you know? Mm-hmm. It was like, like 1989 or something. Mm-hmm. So most people, their first contact with jujitsu is they got like wizard, wizarded by somebody and they're like, oh, I got to try this stuff out. But you, you screwed, you like tossed your buddy around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was kind of fun. <laughs> And, and it was just like, because he and I were always boxing, we were always doing stuff, you know, because mm. he was a dude. Yeah. And that was kind of like, you know, you know, young man, your friendship's usually based on some kind of common sport or something, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Lots of common interests in the in friend groups, usually video games or sports or common right. sports, something like that. Um, how did, did, did he convince you to come? Did something else happen to get you into jiu- to jitsu How did you decide that was something that you wanted to learn? Well, I rolled with a black belt, and that was the end of that. Okay. Okay. And there was no more you'll find out. I found out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I was pretty, you know, um, so I was like, okay, what do I got to do to learn? You know, like, It, you know, the proof is in the pudding, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I've been a martial artist my whole life, so I didn't need any convincing. Yeah. The world would, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this. This is... Mm-hmm. I literally remember thinking to myself, if I get a black belt in this, I'll never lose another fight. Like, I'll never lose a fight in my life. It was so powerful, you know? Right. How did you... Um end up rolling with that black belt? Um, he saw me rolling with a blue belt and beating him up. And then he asked me if I wanted to roll. 
<laughs> okay, yeah. Scared, you know, because I was scrappy, you know. Like, I grew up kind of rough, you know, on mm-hmm. the rough side. You know, and, you know, young man who's, you know, like I said, you know, was mostly raised in the United States, but Irish mother, you know. It's like inside our house, it was still Ireland, you know. Um, right. So there's that whole thing. Like, you better not lose a fight if someone's anywhere near your size, you know. Mm-hmm. You lose to someone who's your size, you'll not come home. Stuff like that, you know. Is that um, is that how it is in Irish households? I didn't know that. <laughs> well, it wasn't mine. <laughs> um, my my family's from Derry, uh, and we're in the very of Ireland. And it's right. It was right. It was all that stuff. In there. So there was a lot of that kind of warlike mentality, mm-hmm. you know. You know, I don't want to go into the whole thing the Irish went through with the British, but when you're in a yeah. big siege on your culture where they're trying to exterminate you, yeah. you develop a warlike mentality, you know? Right, right. And it was absolutely true in my household. Yeah. Um, and I remember I was very young. Um, one of my cousins, someone came home crying. And, and my mother says, what are you crying? Oh, this kid beat me up. And my mother says, out the door. It's all everybody, out the door. We're walking down the street. And I'm like, oh, mom is going to lay down some mama justice, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and... um. They walked a ways and, you know, uh, wait, is that him? My cousin, like, that's him. And my mother looks at my cousin. She says, he looks about your size. And my cousin just started crying. And my mother says to him, you'll fight him again now. And if you lose, you won't come home. Mm. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and man, my cousin jumped on that, jumped that kid. And he's pounding on the kid, screaming, I want to go home. And my mother says, that'll do. And he gets up and, and my mother looked at him and I'll never forget that to my, to this day, I start to tear up when I, when I think my mother looks at me. And she says, now you know what it's like to fight for you. And that was the day I decided that I was never going to lose a fight. I was like, wow. I, you know, because I was, I was very young. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wow. I, I can't even describe that feeling. Yeah. Like. You know, that was like a, a threat of death, you know, like. Never been a complainer as far as how people fight, you know, it's like fight anybody you like. Yeah, I don't understand that anymore. When I was younger, I used to be caught up, you know, martial arts has its own kind of mythos about it in the way that a lot of the people talk. And it's yeah. like. Only technique, no attributes, but Bruce Lee's cool and he had big muscles and all this and that, but everyone else can't, you know? Um, and it's, uh, it's like you, you, you do need to lift. You don't need to lift. You don't have to do regular strength training. You can do like high reps, slow weight. Like it's all this stuff that's like probably not very good advice, but, um, it's like anything just to not get stronger. This boy well, sounds like, you know, there is a big fat secret in martial arts that no one wants to talk about, and that is that most people came to martial arts out of fear. Yeah, and when they say, "Why did you start martial arts?" You know, I was young enough where it was more out of fascination when nice. I started. Um, but, you know, I went through a, a whole stage as a young teenager, 
No, I, I don't remember how old I was exactly, but I remember being afraid that my martial arts wouldn't work. You know, mm -hmm. I totally have been in that zone, right? Yep. Most people come to martial arts because they have a fear inside them that they're trying to quell, right? And they don't want to get mugged. They don't want to get beat up. Something, right? And mm -hmm. even when it's about fitness, they always add in self-defense to their explanation, too. So it's like this hidden fear. Like, well, I've always kind of been afraid some thug would try to beat me up. And I want to get in shape, so I might as well do martial arts because I can get in shape and finally be able to fight, you know? Yeah. And so what happens is if you're not actually fighting, if your martial art isn't judo or wrestling or boxing or kickboxing, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're actually making contact and you've got to get it done or get it done to you. It's one of the two, right? Um, then he's trying to call me and I'm declining. Okay. Um, if that's the case, then you learn to not have that fear anymore because it's purged out of you in the forge of common, right? Mm -hmm. And, but when you're in a martial art where there's a lot of philosophy and not a lot of fighting, that fear never goes away. In fact, it grows um, yeah. because you start to get ranked, you start to get prestige, you start to get recognition for something that you're not even sure you can do. Mm -hmm. And so the secret becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, right? It's almost like being an alcoholic, right? You, they started out of a little secret when you were 13 and you tried that beer with your friends and you didn't want to tell your mom, right? Mm -hmm. and, and now you've got bottles of vodka hidden all over your house and hope your wife doesn't find out that it's obvious to everybody but you that it's a big fat problem. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and it, in, in a way, the whole thing in martial arts is kind of like that, right? got a ton of people teaching people to fight who have never been in a fight. Yeah. And they're teaching people to fight, right? And they've only been in non-contact tournaments, you know? And you don't hear them say, look, I've never been in a real fight. You don't hear them say, hey, I've never fought full contact, but I'm teaching you the sport of XYZ, and in this sport, we don't really make contact, but we're hoping it works out fine for us. You know, yeah. if we do self-defense situations, we can make that adjustment. They don't say that. And they could just say that, right? <laughs> and I think most people would be fine with that. But the ego, you know, that, that hidden secret, you got to protect the secret, right? Yeah. So that's, I think, where all of that stuff comes from. I yeah, they can't, they can't let go of the self-defense thing. It can't just be sport karate. It can't just be, um, you know, Aikido for health. Like it has to be, there has to, you have to put self-defense in there. Even though you've right. never been in a fight, you've never studied anything on physiology, you've never studied anything on situational awareness or escalation of force, you've never worked a door, you've never worked security of any kind, you know, for what, for all, for all I know you've probably barely ever even been in a contentious argument with a stranger. <laughs> it's right. like, but um, oh, I, a lot of those. Well, actually all of the above, I can check all of the above. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I'm alive by luck. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But a lot of people have not been able to do, they've never, they've never been that. And I went through that phase where I was like, Oh crap. I don't want to admit that all the, Kumse and the kata and all the stuff that I've been doing for 15 years might not be useful to me. And I actually might not be able to fight very well, yeah. but that, <laughs> but deep down I knew, and that's about the time when I started doing like jujitsu, uh, I deep down, I knew, uh Oh, <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. I have reputation among my friends. Maybe it's time to like do some other things, make sure that I actually know how to fight. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because 
you know, like what I was saying earlier about being culturally biased in a certain direction, you know, before we lost our contact. Um, yeah. You know, that, that breeds a certain amount of uh, the desire to get in a fight, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's that stereotype of British and English where it's like, hey, let's go have a brawl, you know? like, And it's kind of true. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's kind of true. And I was watching this thing. A friend of mine sent me a thing from, a, it's called, I guess it's from a, a site called Irish Daily. And this guy's sitting there talking. He's like, oh, I was outside the club. And I was about to get in a fight with this guy and I was looking at him and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him and I'm about to throw a punch at him. And I says to him, are you my son? <laughs> and he said, are you my father? And we, we had that moment and, and we hugged it out. Turned out there was no relation, so I headbutted him and they took him away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not really. Damn. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 uh, and he goes, it just goes to show you. There could be people out there and you could know them. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, you, know, I, you know, and you know, it's it's kind of funny with that. There's that cultural thing where it's like you're expected. You're expected that you can uh, can stand your ground. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're expected to maybe be acquiring ground that's not actually yours. You know. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. I, I think that's that's a ground to stand. <laughs> I, I think most men, when the time comes are expected to be that way, but they don't, but they were never expected until, to, until that moment, which is a problem. So as, as boys, boys are no longer expected to hold their ground. They're no longer expected to, yeah. if they have to get in a fight, like I don't want boys running around getting into fights all the time, but you, you, if you, you sometimes you got to get in a fight. Sometimes you have to fight. And, um, yeah. You don't you don't learn that in school. I, I don't think that parents really, dads especially, aren't, aren't really teaching that to their kids anymore. Where, yeah, uh, there's, the importance yeah. of being able to hold your own. Yeah, well, there's a whole thing. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to speak on the subject of why you shouldn't fight if you don't know how. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when I hear people that can't fight telling me how fighting is wrong. You know, that has a real hollow ring to it. Yeah. It's like, you know, and I'll ask people, why is fighting wrong? And they'll be like, oh, because violence doesn't, you know, help. And I'm like, well, what if it is something? What if the violence is exactly what's solving the problem? Mm -hmm. And they don't have an answer because they've never been fight. Yeah. You know, they, they can't talk to me about, you know, you know, I, I punched this guy in the face and I was reflecting about everything later and I realized that I could have, you know, maybe I I could have de-escalated at this one moment in the conflict and I didn't. Yeah. Uh, I, they can't talk about their feelings about a fight because they've never been in a fight. So, yep. they're pre- you know, they're like, they're like the preacher that's preaching while he's molesting the choir boys, you know? Uh, it's annoying. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it, it, that's, that's right. They, they don't understand how it functions socially. Violence is, can be antisocial, but in the male subculture, especially young, young, not, not older men, but really young men, there are some social tensions that cannot there are understandings that cannot be come to until the two men come to blows and then they, they, they respect each other. And it's like magic. Sometimes one of my best friends, he tried to bully me and we, we had some fight and um, I just did cartwheels and he got upset and, you know, tried to hurt me for like 20 minutes. Um, We, we ended up being good friends later, but there are some, you can't come to an understanding sometimes with, with other men, unless you come to blows and that, uh, there's like a there's like a another level of discourse happening that's physical, and then once you've reached that, now 
the whatever the squabble was before is framed differently. And it's actually there's there seems like there's a way forward. Well, you know, in my in my view, I'm not a uh, I'm not a social scientist. Well, I don't think people that study sociology are actually scientists, but <laughs> got a bunch of ideas that they're studying in order to reinforce their own ideas. But mm-hmm. I think what it is is can I trust you when the wolf shows up? to stand shoulder to shoulder with me and fight the wolf. Yeah. Can I try? And I need to know that you can be in my hunting party and not get me killed. Yeah. If you're going to be my friend and you're going to be in my group of friends on a DNA level, right? Like in the male DNA, we all know that when the bear walks into the village, we're the ones fighting, not the women. Right. We all, we all know that. And many times in society, you hear people talking like the women are going to grab the sticks and go beat on the bear. And every, every man knows that's just not true. It's not going to happen. It's not happening. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, vis-a-vis the cockroach in the living room. Right? <laughs> yes. The spider in the bathtub. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, people can talk all they want about uh, the archaic nature of the division of labor uh, Mm -hmm. in traditional relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as a mouse shows up, all that bullshit goes right under the bridge. Okay? Because it's the guy. If someone breaks in your house in the middle of the night, your wife is not going to get out of bed and say, stay here, honey, by the phone. I'm going to go see what that noise in the garage is. Yeah, that's not happening. That's never happened, and every single guy knows it. Mm-hmm. So, in our DNA, we know that. And as young men, especially men entering puberty, we are driven by forces that are greater than ourselves towards forming groups that we can trust, basically, with our life. Right. And, you know, in one sense, maybe that's a hunting party. And in another sense, maybe that's a fire team like they do in the military. You know, hey, the guy on my right, and the guy on my left. Those two, those are the two I'll die for. Because each of them will die for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that bond and that trust has to be honed somewhere. So you get young men that, that, that have a need to form a group and have a need for friendship. And many, many times that friendship is wrought through conflict where they prove to each other their worth. Yes. And once the worth is established, the bond can be made. But you cannot make a bond with someone that you don't know their worth. If that person's going to go into battle with you, you can't do it. And so... You know, you get the one boy who wants to be part of the group and you've got the four boys that are in the group already and here comes the latest maybe potential member and he's going to get picked on, okay? And he wants to be picked on. That's why he's hovering around the group. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll, he'll get picked on. He'll get punched in the shoulder. He'll get knocked down. He'll go home and his mom will say, hey, don't go around those boys anymore. And the very next day, he's hovering around them again. So mama doesn't know what the hell mama's talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if he talks to dad and dad understands, some dads don't understand either because they've been brainwashed since the time they were in kindergarten that that their instincts are wrong. Okay. Yeah. The The dad will say, look, son, you need to stand your ground. Because he knows that it's absolutely necessary, not that he wins, but that he is proving his worth as a compatriot, you know, as as a member of the group. Will you run or will you fight? And we need to know. You can't be in our group if we can't trust you. Yes. Right? Under threat of harm. Are you one of us or are you not? And 
that's what that is, you know, and the young man knows it somewhere deep inside, he goes back and his dad will tell him, look, you need to stand your ground. You're probably going to get a black eye, but you need to go down swing. You need to go down swing and I'll be there to catch, you, you know, mm-hmm. but you have to do it. You've got to show up flagpole after school on Wednesday. You need to be seen standing there waiting for Bobby. You know, if Bobby said, meet me at the flagpole, you need to be there. Right. And uh, I think a lot in a lot of, you know, most, most school teachers are women and they don't understand that. It's not how they operate, you know? Um, and so a lot of the young men now are just being taught. They're being taught to socialize the way women socialize, not the way men socialize. And, and then they have to try to do it later. And it's a mess. It's a big fat mess, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it gets increasingly, instead of being normal, it's, uh, it's fringe. Oh, this is what the guys say behind closed door at, uh, you know, this at such an event because it's socialized out of the workplace too. Yes. Can't, you can't, you know, one, one of the drawbacks sometimes of, of a, of a a sort of co-ed workplace is that it does change the social dynamics. Now women do bring certain things to the workplace that make it more pleasant. Um, but it, but, uh, the, the, there's always a trade-off and and one of the trade-offs is that the men can't be as liberal with each other in, in the way that they speak in the way that they, they, they develop their behaviors because while the men understand what's going on, it will be offensive and create, uh, it, it'll create bad, a bad team environment um, for, for people outside of that subculture that don't understand that that's the way that men relate to each other. It's like uh, Gran, Gran Torino where, uh, where um, the main character is, is trying to teach the, uh, I think he's Vietnamese is a young Vietnamese man. He lives, there's, there's not really a lot of men in his house um, for, for whatever reason. I think they had escaped a war or some at that time. And, uh, he, he's trying to teach him how to talk to other men. <laughs> so it's like, you got to insult him. You got to uh, shake, you look them in the eye, shake their hand hard. Um, and the, the, he goes in the barber shop, and that's the way the guys talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and, that, and it's a really, it's an endearing scene because it shows that um, being in, just, just lopping an insult at somebody you know is is can be actually a form of intimacy not 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 a way that you're trying to tear that person down necessarily no it's exactly what it is it's intimacy yeah. uh, it is um i throw this insult at you because i know you can take it so i'm affirming your strength as a man by demonstrating to everyone in sight how well you can repartee and how smart you are to, to have a snappy comeback. And even if you don't have a comeback, the fact that you can take it mm-hmm. and not run crying is me demonstrating to everybody around me my esteem for you because I trust. You know, and it's the same thing I tell my students. You know, uh, I'll, be, I'll be 60 in April, and, um, you know, I'm rolling around with guys in their 20s and smashing them all day long. Yeah. You know, and some people that are new that come into the academy and they'll say, "Oh, how hard we sh- should we go?" And I say, "You should go as hard as you can because you're going to be fighting for your life." You know, yeah. <laughs> I'll be nice. I'll be nice to you, but you need to bring it. Right. You know, and you know, and I'll tell them with me, you bring it. With your se- fellow classmates, you guys kind of establish the vibe that you want to have. You know what I mean? I said, yeah. but, and I, and I tell students too, um, going easy, you know, if there's a guy wearing a belt that's higher than yours, um, going after him is a sign of respect. It's not a sign of disrespect. Mm-hmm. If that guy's a purple belt and you're a blue belt and you're, and you're bringing it, that's because you trust that that belt means something around his waist. And that you need to be 100% just to survive with him. You know? If, if you're like, oh, you're a purple belt, but I'm going easy because I think I'll hurt you. Well, then you don't really, 
you know, you're not really, you're making a judgment about their jujitsu ability and their other stuff that may not be interpreted as respect. Right. Um, you know, the, the male female difference is a different thing Mm -hmm. uh, because there's also socialization involved and there's also a whole lifetime of, uh, a paradigm shift that happen, has to happen for a female to be successful in jiu-jitsu, right? Yeah. So a man going easy with a woman is a different thing. It's because she's been socialized a completely different way and she doesn't have a lot of the tools that men have when they come in, even without training. You know what I mean? Right. So then it's a sign of uh, understanding social differences. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you're willing to ease up with her so she can start developing the tools that she didn't develop as a girl. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, girl in the sense of as a younger female person, mm-hmm. yeah. not as a girl in general, you know, but, um, and then there's girls that wrestled in high school, you know, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And they, and they come in and you can see right away, they do have those tools, yeah. you know? And, you know, so making that judgment with your classmates is one thing, but if someone's wearing a black, thing, you know, it's on. It's like, why, why are you wearing that black? You know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Is that is that how you establish your learning environment for your students? Is that you you kind of give them a, a heuristic, as as what I'm hearing, and where it's like, look, if they have a higher belt than you, you need to go hard because that that person is has a, a higher skill level the belt means something but when you're with somebody who's more peer level you need to establish among yourselves what each of you is willing to manage at that point in time yeah because you know for black belts for my black belts uh, if you can't defend yourself i'm not giving you the damn belt mm-hmm. they've been tested if you can't take it, I'm not giving you the belt. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm fond of telling people I hate promoting you. You know, it's just like, <laughs> like I don't give people a belt until I feel guilty. Yeah. Serious. And my students have gone to the best schools in the world. And the report comes back. It's always the same. I went with every blue belt there and none of them could handle me and they had to put me with the purple belts, you know? Nice. Um, every single time. It's never failed. And that's, you know, like Hodger Gracie's school, Henzo Gracie, Marcelo Garcia, like the top schools. Mm-hmm. My students go to the top schools in the world and their belt stands and that's it, you know? Um, because I won't give it to them unless it's real. I will not do it. I, I I can't live with myself if I do that. Um, I've seen that you you do seem to have people. I looked at your website and and just kind of looked around. You seem to you do produce competitors. If I'm if I what I've seen is yeah. is accurate. How do you balance between <laughs> teaching self defense and teaching competition? Do you have a like a particular like framework or approach or a, like a timeline in the belts? How does that work? So what I do is. Um, it's not a timeline with the belts. Okay. It, it's an ability line. Mm-hmm. Period. Yeah. You know, I had one guy who was a white belt for three years. White belt for three years. He's one of my black belts now. Mm-hmm. But he just wouldn't listen. Stubborn, stubborn guy. And I love this guy to death. I mean, in a bar fight, he's the guy I want beside me because this guy is just down, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, here's a funny story. His name is Nas. He's amazing. Nas is amazing, right? And one of my friends came inside the school one day. This guy's like 5'7", 205 pounds, world-class Greco-Roman wrestler, right? And he was my Greco training partner for like four years after college, right? And so me and him are friends for a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. He's in the door. And, you know, I throw an insult at him and he's like, I'll knock you the fuck out. You know, like and <laughs> we're doing that whole man, right? Right. Nas is across the room and I hear in his Tunisian accent, hey, if he goes down, you got 10 guys on you, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, 
No, I said, it's okay. He's my friend. He goes, okay, professor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Guys, it's like, he is, you know, he is just, he didn't give two fucks what anyone thought when he said that. <laughs> it was like, I'm just making this statement right now. Because he didn't know my friend. Yeah. He just heard what he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just everything stopped. He was just like, that's it. The men are lining up. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. That's endearing. It's endearing. Because he didn't know this other guy. He didn't know this guy was in group. He thought he was out group. It's like, you don't talk that way to people in my group. <laughs> right. And I built like a brick shit house, right? Yeah. And and Nas is like, you're going down now. <laughs> like, yeah. No <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> so I really like that, you know. Uh, that was that was just like excellent. I don't know how I got onto that story. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about self defense and competition, but um, oh, okay. so for me, if it works in a fight, it'll work in a tournament. Okay, because mm-hmm. a fight is much more real. Mm-hmm. Um, now. Given that, um, there are things that you can do in tournaments according to the rules. You can play by the rules and win. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've competed against people who, if we continued to fight, I'd kill them. Um, But in that five-minute time period or whatever the time frame was, they ended up an advantage ahead of me. But I could tell that at the end of that match, they had 50% of their energy left and I had 85. And, you know, three more minutes and they wouldn't be able to breathe anymore and I'd kill, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, but they managed the match perfectly. They expended all their energy right at the time limit, played everything right, and they beat me. And I respect that. Mm-hmm. You know, not one of those guys. Oh, if it was a real fight, I would have won. Yes, I know that that's that's the case. But the fact is that you're better than I am at this. You yeah. won today. You're the better man. I'll proudly hold your hand up and say, "This guy beat me." You know, mm-hmm. and you know he knows the rules better than me. He knows the strategy involved in this situation better than me. Yeah, and. I don't have a problem with that. I need to get better at that. If I'm going to show up at a tournament, I'm not going to show up with some BS attitude that uh, the tournament's now supposed to become my world. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I need to get better at that environment if I want to be the guy in that environment, right? Um, so what I do is I choose the fighting environment as my home environment. Mm-hmm. And then I adjust my manners when I visit my friends. Right, mm-hmm. and um, there's things I can't do in a tournament that I might do in a fight, and I don't look at that and start crying about it because there's no crying in jujitsu, right? Yeah. So I need to have other tools that I don't use in a fight, but I can use in a tournament. So, like for me personally, I don't I don't ever play half guard, right? Okay. Um, I mean, I'll play spiral guard and I'll play knee shield guard and, and I differentiate between those and half guard. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about kind of classical half guard, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm really good at not letting someone play half guard. And, like, I'm really good at passing half guard. Really good. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the reason I don't play, right? Um, you know, when you're really good at, at fighting against something, and it never works on you, why would you have it in your repertoire, right? So, um, that's just my personal jujitsu. It's not even my analysis of whether half guard is good or not. I'm not making a statement about that. Yeah. I'm only making a statement about half guard doesn't work well on me. Mm -hmm. And I'm really good at passing people in the half guard. Yeah. So I don't put it in my repertoire as one of my offensive tools because I have to have confidence in what I'm using, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, if I know if the guy does A, B, and C, I'm screwed, you know, I'm, I don't want that in my reference bar. Right. I want to be able to be, believe that I can fight with this and win, right? Yeah. So, well, I know if I go to a tournament, there's going to be people doing things that I don't do, but I need to know the things they do. So I do teach, like, I've got students that play half time. And I teach them to play better. I just don't use it when I free run train. Mm-hmm. I, understand, I understand it. I know the moves. I know how to do it, mm-hmm. which is why I can pass it well, because I understand what all the traps, zaps, and pitfalls are that the guy wants to perpetrate on me, right? Right. Um, and I know how to avoid all of them and stop it all and get by them, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that means on the other side that when my student wants to play off guard, I can show them all those tricks and procedures, you know, and say, hey, play like this. If the guy doesn't do that, do this. You know, the whole thing, right? So it's an interesting thing because I'll have students, although I'm a more of a self-defense oriented instructor, I have students who go to tournaments and I prepare them well for the tournaments. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's nobody that knows every move of, you know, butterfly. Guard. There's nobody that knows every move of closed guard. There's nobody that knows every move of half guard, right? Yeah. But if you, if someone has a, a good repertoire of solid moves and they practice them diligently, they can use them in the tournament and win. Because all the established moves will work if done at a high enough level of proficiency okay Mm -hmm. um so what it always comes down to is have i spent more time mounted on people and stopping mount escapes or have you spent more time escaping them right Mm -hmm. when you and i meet right if you're playing half guard or you're playing anything how many guys have you swept that do what I do, right? Versus how many guys have I passed that do what you do? That's really the, the equation, right? Like yeah. for if you're going to set some odds and there's a, a betting game on this fight, right? Yeah. So that's the way I look at it. And that's the way I teach my students. It's like, look, if you want to do well in the turn, understand by your weight class and your division, the things that are happening there and practice for it, you know, because you're walking into a turn. You need to know, oh, I'm a purple belt. You know, all the purple belts are doing X, Y, and Z. It's up to you to be current on your class and your weight division by watching matches from tournaments. It's up to you, you know, do your homework, right? And there's always trends in jujitsu, right? And, so each of my individual athletes, it's their responsibility to do their homework if they want to compete. And because your jujitsu is yours, it's not mine. I'm a, I am a resource for you. Um, yeah. But I'm not trying to make anybody into me. Right. You know, I'm teaching, I teach by principle and philosophy and I teach moves just as an example of the principle, I don't teach moves as like, this is the blueprint for you to win. Here's the move that I'm teaching you. So you can see what I mean philosophically when I say that the vector of the person's weight is important. Look how his weight is moving. Look how this move takes advantage of it. Understand the principle. This move is just an example of the principle, Mm -hmm. right? This may not be the move you use, but it's the move that I'm showing you so that I can, you know, it, I'm almost surrounding the principle in a little cage so you can look inside and go, oh, I see what you mean by the principle, right? And then you got to take that principle and extrapolate your own game to, to uh, bring those principles to life when you're training, right? Yeah. So everybody's repertoire is their own repertoire. Right. And, I teach by philosophy and principle and I use examples, right? But for a person to get ready for a tournament, they need to do their research. They need to watch those blue belt matches. They need to see things that, uh, 
you know, and I tell them, when you watch those matches, the number one thing you want to find is what makes you go, oh, shit, I hope my guy doesn't do that. Because that's your DNA telling you what you suck, right? Mm -hmm. And you see some guy do something, you go, oh, shit, you need to learn that. You need to learn what he just did, how to stop him. Because if that's an oh shit moment for you, then that's your DNA telling you that you're not good in that position. Right. Right. And listen to your instincts. You know, it's all about feel and instinct. Right. So, and then come to me and show me the match and talk to me about what it is that fascinates you about this match. And then I will help you get ready. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I teach a group but I teach individuals and, but they have a part in that. They have a responsibility in that um, to understand what they're trying to do. They've got to own their goals, right? Each person has their own style of, of play. They they have their guards that they prefer. They have their tactics that they prefer. And that's going to be, there's a lot of, there's a confluence of a lot of dynamics that, that, sort of create a person's personal style. Um, that's, that's a great approach to, to teaching BJJ. Do you, do you have examples of, of bad teaching? Cause I, I watched your video with, I believe Jerry, Jerry Liu, Liu or Liu, um, um, from a long time ago. I bite your arm with my. Yes. <laughs> but I, my, but yeah, there was an interview, there's an interview where you, you were talking about um, you had a, an approach to jiu you, you You're about teaching good jujitsu, and that you did believe that there were some some bad approaches out there. And I was wondering if you were willing to um, unpack what you thought those bad approaches were. Okay. So, um, I don't like teaching systems. Mm-hmm. And that's huge, right? Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do A and my opponent's going to do A or B. And I'm like, really? That's what you're teaching? You know? Mm -hmm. Did you think about that rock he just picked up? Is that part of your A, B plan? You know, like, I mean, that's not fighting jujitsu at all at that point. You know? Yeah. That's fine. Um, you know, you're playing, you know, guard and the guys, you know, you're in a parking lot and you're near one of those cement parking blocks. Really? What part, which, which is that cement block that you're backed up against? Is that A or B? <laughs> you know, in, in your yeah. system. Yeah. So, so that kind of thing buzz, bothers me mm-hmm. because, um, and it would bother me less if people would make a declaration, you know, um, if people would say, Hey, you know, I'm teaching this system, but this is a, a system when you're for, you're formatted under a, a rule, a system of rules and under the normal rules of competition, everything I say applies, but outside of the rules of that competition when I say the guy can do A or B maybe he won't he's going to do C, D and F you know and who knows what C, D and F are you know what I mean yeah Um, so it's not about the moves the moves most of the time when I see people teaching systematic movement the moves the moves they're teaching are good you know Mm mm-hmm a lot of guys have used these moves in tournaments and it works. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I just have a philosophical disagreement with uh, presenting it <laughs> yeah. without kind of caveat. Presentation, understand. And, the, and even in with even within the rule set, sometimes there's more than just the, the options that are presented. You you run into a problem where always there's try- always more than the A B option. Always. Yeah. yeah. Always. Okay. <laughs> like it's funny because I was going off about this the other day. I was doing a little lecture in my class. And I was like, I want to make a DVD. 
with jujitsu movements on it. And I'm going to be the first guy in history to say, okay, so look, I'm setting the guy up like this, and then he does A, and I do this, and then we get to this point. And if the guy puts his hands right here, I'm fucked, and I have to start over. <laughs> you know, because you... <laughs> nah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm here in my move, and uh, he grabs my, my gi like this, or he hooks my ankle like that. Okay, time to get out of dodge because this guy knows what he's doing and this shit isn't going to work. Right. You never see anybody say that. You never see anybody tell the truth. Yeah. That's, I, the, thing that, that's the thing that bothers me. So I want to make a DVD where, you know, some things are successful and other things aren't. Where it's like, it's a fight, bro. It's a fight. Yeah. <laughs> the guy. You know, he's going to do A or B. And if he does some shit from Zimbabwe that I've never seen before, I'm going to fight my way back to a neutral position because I have no idea what this guy's doing. And if it's all the latest, you know, and I'm not up on it, I don't want to be part of his demo ring, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm fighting back to neutral. Sorry. Yeah. Right? Or, or, and or end up with a snapped ankle or a busted right. finger. No, you, you, no. Just don't, you don't know what he's, this guy's going to do. Yeah, but it, so it's, it's just hilarious to me that in every instructional video, every move is a success. It's, that's the most hilarious thing. Yeah. About in, and it's the most hilarious thing about instruction that I see. Mm -hmm. I, watch, I see people teach and everything always works. Yeah. And it's like, you're lying to your students. Yeah. It doesn't always work. Yeah, you know, my 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 favorite one is where you have somebody who used to move successfully in competition, and this is like a black belt, and he's high level, and this is like his personal, it's his thing. But you, if you you he and he's teaching like if you're gonna do a jumping triangle, here's how you do it. Here's how to make it more high uh, uh, percentage. But then you look at his actual finishing percentage, and it's like he's done it like three times. Right. So it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, but yeah. like, is this, should I be spending my time on this? And the, and it, and the yeah. answer is like 90% of the time is no, I should not right. be trying to, to do a jumping right. triangle from yeah. whatever. I, you know, like I'm a wrestler, you know, mm -hmm. as well, jujitsu guy. And in wrestling, there's a thing we call high percentage moves. Yeah. Right. And uh, we call it bread and butter or go-to or high percentage moves, right? Yeah. And there's stats on every move in wrestling. And there's high percentage moves and medium percentage moves and low percentage moves. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a wrestler wants to do a low percentage move. And the coach will go, you know, that's a low percentage move, right? And he goes, yeah, but I feel it and it's successful for me. And it's like, okay, let's see you do it. And, and that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. But there's always that idea, is this high or low percentage, right? Yeah. And that's part of what I do is I always teach high percentage stuff, you know, yeah. because I'm trying to increase the success quotient of my, of my students, right? Yeah. I think that high percentage moves, people that can make those moves work is because there's something about their own personal training, their own personal style that has led to the moment where they figured out the timing and the setup of that and yeah. trying to teach that to people with a different game context, different, different body types, different competition experience, different approaches and strategies to actually fighting and rolling or, or whatever that just, it doesn't match. You can't just, you can't just teach it out of the context of somebody else's per training journey, basically. Right. So what I do is, um, Okay, for someone like me, I don't know how many moves I know, but it's a shitload, right? Mm -hmm. I, know a lot, I know a lot of damn moves. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say, uh, let's say I know, just for easy math, 365 moves, right? So I'm going to practice these moves and be proficient at all of them. That's one move a day if I practice just that move that day, right? But then I only practice the move once a year, and that's no good, right? Um, 
So let's say I cut that down and I go, well, I'll practice two moves a day and I only practice that move every six months. Now. It's still no good, right? Mm-hmm. I got to get to the point where I'm practicing like a hundred moves a day so I can practice a, a move every three days to stay with the, within the frequency intensity paradigm, right? To be mm-hmm. good at something. Yeah. <laughs> I need the frequency of at least every two or three days, or I'm not going to have relevant skills, right? I'm not right. I'm going to adapt properly. I'm not going up the adaptation scale. I'm going down, right? Yep. And so, so now I got to practice 100 moves a day. Well, I'm fucked, right? I'm screwed. So the fact is that the more you learn, uh, the less you can practice everything you know, mm-hmm. and it forces you by nature towards practicing the fundamental. And so if I have a basic, let's say, 10 fundamental movements, uh, I look at those as puzzle pieces, Okay. And those 10 puzzle pieces can be formed to shape a trunk of a tree as a picture, right? And then the tree starts to branch. And I can take those fundamental puzzle pieces and I can make any branch on that tree, right? And then the leaves are the individual moves. And I can take those puzzle pieces and make a picture of any leaf I want. Does that make sense? Yep. Um. I don't have any idea what those puzzle pieces would look like, but you know, they're, I think it's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good mental picture, right? Right. Um, but we're not talking about the shape of the puzzle pieces. I'm refused to get into that. <laughs> yeah. We don't, don't, don't boggle your head with the entirety of the analogy. We don't have to do the <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> don't ask questions of the metaphor. Just that. Do not question the metaphor. <laughs> so, don't deconstruct my metaphors. Yes. <laughs> um, so basically, if I can get a good picture of what my fundamentals are, I can practice them every day. Mm-hmm. And if I'm cognitively present in my practice, which I always am, um, I know exactly which fundamentals I'm practicing that day to do the moves that I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So as I'm doing that move, I'm practicing. Each part of that move is one of my fundamentals that I have. And I'm aware, I'm painfully aware of each one of those fundamental aspects of the move I'm practicing as well as the feel of the overall move. Yeah. Does that make sense? That makes sense. So I can practice all my fundamentals every day. And I can change the moves because I'm painstakingly accurate about the fundamentals of each move. I can pick a different move every day and I can practice a move once every couple of months and still do it very well because I practice all the fundamental elements of that move mm-hmm. in every other day of the month already. Right? Yeah. So now it's just real time sensitivity. I only need to be sensitive to the order that I'm doing the fundamentals in. Yeah. And I can do it on the fly. On the fly, I can shift the order of my fundamental movements. I'm capable of that over the board, so to speak, to use a, a chess term, right? And that's how I train. And so what happens is I end up being very proficient at like almost everything I know how to do because I'm so aware of the individual aspects that it's made up of mm-hmm. in other thing that I do. Yes. That sounds really fi- that sounds really similar to the way that Matt Thornton from uh, Straight Blast Gym approaches training in the way he teaches when he teaches a move he teaches the fundamentals. The move is just the the representation of the fundamentals that you need to learn. Okay. Yeah, that's it. it it's uh it's a reorganization of your fundamentals. Every move is a reorganization of some some of your fundamentals. Not all of them, but some of them, right? Mm-hmm. 
So if you want to be proficient in all your skills, make sure you're practicing all of your fundamentals every day, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe for me to practice all 10 of my fundamentals, I might need to practice three moves that day or five moves that day, right? Yeah. And I need to do that, right? So you've got to be responsible about your training. you got to, you know, you can't just, oh, that's my favorite move. I just do that every day. Well, that, that favorite move of yours doesn't have all your fundamentals in it. So, you know, as you learn more, you, you do less, right? right? So, um, and that's what jujitsu is. You're learning more and more and doing less and less every day of your life. Um, until you get down to those, you know, I picked an arbitrary number of 10, you know, because I'm no good at math. So <laughs> I like nice round numbers. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's, that's all I have to say about that. Cool. So, um, you're you're one of the original non-Brazilian black belts, is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So how <laughs> how was it training back in the? I think it was the mid '90s. Is that when you were still working your way towards a towards a black belt? Yeah, I got my black belt uh, May first, nineteen ninety six. Nice. What, what was it like training back then? Did you train with Hoist all the way to black belt? Did you end up some uh, learning under somebody else? Like, what what was the culture like? Uh, they were all together, like very close together still when I started. Okay. Right? So I would train with like everybody that's known. You know, we would end up being there. You know, like. Uh, people hadn't split up into all their totally individual schools yet, you know? Right. Right. Um, so, um, trained with Hoist, Helson, Hickson. I trained with Elio, um, uh, a bunch of people, just basically everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it was like, they were all here. Like they all came here and, and, there wasn't a bunch of different schools, you know? Yeah. It's like, so I got exposed to basically everybody and, um, they, you know, like, you know, like Helson, he was going to open his school in Hawaii or maybe he already had it, but he was still in Torrance, you know, Mm -hmm. and all those guys, you know, they were all still around, you know? Um, so the world hadn't spread out yet, right? It was still in that stage where you're basically exposed to everybody when you're a beginner, you know? Yeah. And Did you train at Torrance? Uh, yeah. Way, way back in the day? Wow. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, did, yeah. You, <laughs> did you train in one of the garages, one of the infamous Gracie garages? I wasn't a garage guy. No, okay. I, was, I wasn't a garage guy. It was right after the garage. It was like, okay. like right after. Right. Like immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, was it like, um, was it difficult to be like, uh, a part of the group? Like, did you have to prove yourself? Was it, was it like a kind of like, like a, a gang to, well, it, what it was like was the Brazilians came here to make money, not to teach jujitsu. Okay. Okay. So, um, Consequently, the only way to make money was to teach jujitsu. <laughs> but uh, they didn't really want people that weren't Brazilian to know. Okay. So, so you're in class, you're not getting coached, you know? Um, and, you know, if you're working with someone who happens to be Brazilian, they get all the coaching and you get none of the coaching. There was a lot of that. Mm. Um, it was very clear that you weren't the one that they cared whether you got good or not. Okay. And it was just the way it is, you know? Um, you know, I think that's, I think it's human nature. I don't think, you know, I mean, I'm Irish, dude. Look at the British. You're like, come on. <laughs> you know, it's, that shit's been going on since the beginning of time. Right. <laughs> so, right. Hey, you know, whatever. I'm so like, yeah, whatever. I, obviously it, it, 
obviously it changed because you were eventually able to become a black belt. Did you, did you actually like end up learning a lot of what you learned from somebody else? Like not directly from the Gracie's or uh, no, did it, did I it change I, or. Well, what happened is I got promoted by someone else. Uh-huh. Um, so Ken Gabrielson, who was like the second non-Brazilian to get his black belt. Yeah. Uh, he got his from Haleson Gracie. Um, and I was a purple belt at the time. And I was, I was already beating black belts and there wasn't, there were no brown belts that could be, you know, Mm -hmm. but you know, something happened with Corian and great Ku Klux, you know, Ku Klux kind of left the fold. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the word went out, no more American black belts kind of thing. Right. Mm. Because there was a thing about keeping control, you know? Yeah. And Horian wanted to expand. And this was before the idea of the affiliate school came up. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was give someone a black belt and they open a school for them. Right. Traditional. And Ku Klux went to New York and broke away from Horian. And that was it. There weren't going to be any more American black belts after that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Ken happened to get his black belt right around that time. I mean, there was a... It, I don't know if anyone's really sure whether Ken or Greg got it first. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was close, right? Right. And so it was like, no, you're not going to get promoted, right? So here I am at Purple Belt. And I'm just killing everybody. You know, and, you know, not getting, and I was at, uh, I'm not going to name names, but I was at a, at a, at a workout and a guy was there from Brazil and he was a purple belt and he's tearing through the class and I'm just sitting on the side and I'm a purple belt. And I hear the instructor say, oh, if he was my student, he'd be a brown belt. I would, that guy needs to be a brown belt. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I got up, walked over, challenged the guy to a match. And me and that guy, dude, that was a cat fight for like 15 straight minutes. And I tapped him out. And I tapped him out right in front of the instructor. (laughs) Like like a sacrifice. (laughs) And then I waited about a week. And nothing was happening. And I went to my instructor and I said, you know, no disrespect, but I'd like to know what I need to do to move up. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're doing good. Just keep doing what you're doing. And I was like, uh, fuck that. You know? Yeah. Because that to me was the last show. I was like, I'm done. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I had heard about this American guy who was a black man. So I went and talked to him. And, uh, We talked and, um, you know, he said, show me what you got, you know, and I went through all his guys and he was like, okay, you're the real deal, you know, like, um, and then he and I got together and trained in private, you know, he said, I need to roll with you and see what your level is. Um, at that session, he was like, look, if I could make you skip a belt and give you a black belt, I would, but I can't. So if you want it, I'll give you a brown belt and then stick around, you know? So I, I got the brown, the brown belt from Ken Gabrielson and I started teaching for him, training with him and, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, put my time in, you know? Um, he offered me the black belt and I, uh, and it wasn't that long. And I wore, I said, well, I'd be more comfortable if I wore the brown belt a little longer, just traditional kind of feeling, you know, because I'm a traditional martial artist, you know? Yeah. Um, and then uh, I wanted to start teaching on my own. And I talked to him and he said, look, man, you want your black belt? You can just drive down here right now and I'll give it to you. You already know what, what I think. You know? <laughs> nice. <laughs> right. 
so, it's a big so, vote of confidence. Oh yeah, and it, you know it was, you know he was an honest guy. You know he's an honest guy. I have all the respect in the world. To him. He's like super, just a great human being, right? No bullshit. You know, yeah. just straight up. You know, very accomplished. You know, not just in jujitsu. You know, uh, living in Colorado now. He's, you know, uh, he's a fire chief in Colorado. You know, he's like this guy's an accomplished guy. You know, yeah. And and uh, you know, he's a corral, he's corral belt and uh, and a fire chief, and he's got family, and he's raised his sons. I mean, this guy's a legit. You know, OG accomplished guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, no surprise that he treated me fairly, right? Right. Um, yeah. You That's know, and, yeah, and, and so, uh, you know, that's how it happened, and and it's interesting, right? It's like, you know, he he he's fond of saying he's like the Rosa Parks of jujitsu, which is kind of. Because I was saying that until I heard him say it, and then I stopped saying it because he's ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Rose, Rose is a popular gal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's just what it was like, you know? It's like sit in the back of the bus, Gringo. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard, you know, Gene LaBelle had an issue to training judo with way back in the day with, with, with some of the, the Japanese that came over to the United States. Like it's, it was, people don't realize that it was that way back then. It didn't, you know. Yeah. And it, it, funny anecdote. I got my black belt from the same lineage as uh, Gene LaBelle. Oh, that's very cool. That's very cool. Right. It, his, his judo school and my judo school are literally the exact same. School. That's like, awesome. Same location of the Tenry Lynn. Yeah, it's fun. That is awesome. Um, so before, I, I want to be respectful of your time. We've, we've been on for quite a bit now, even with the, the break that we took. But um, so I, I wanted to ask you about uh, um, gym desk. Like, do, how's that, how's it helped you kind of manage your gym and focus more on, uh, on teaching? Well, first of all, the interface is very easy to use. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not hard to figure things out, you know, when you, yeah. when, when you talk, you know, toggle on something, the next thing that comes up is like, Oh, that makes sense. You know? Mm-hmm. And I get that word for that is intuitive. Um, right. um, the, the fonts, the colors, the shapes of the modals and stuff like that are friendly. It doesn't scare you. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, as a, you know, I, I do web development myself, so I'm kind of aware of all those aspects of it. Yes. Yeah. And it is, you can trust it, so it's easy to let it handle what it handles. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, you're not always looking at it, trying to figure it out. It's e- very easy for people to sign up, sign a waiver put their payment information in. They can do all that online by themselves. And all you do is look at it and open up your dashboard and go, oh, that new guy did sign up. Did he put a payment? Oh, he did. Oh, look, there's his first payment. Okay, I can close the app and go teach. You know, like, Mm -hmm. and I know that that guy, I can look at it and go, okay, his payments are going to go through. Automatic emails are great, you know, because it's going to email him. The invoice options are really good. I can send another invoice or cancel something or edit his membership. It just everything's within two, two clicks of happy there, right? Yeah. So, you know, I've got yeah. like a two click limit. Two click you know? limit. Yeah. Then my, my iPad pro becomes a shot put after that. Yeah. <laughs> I just start I start using the iPad for metabolic training. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's like a, the new, that's the new user experience limit. Two clicks. <laughs> right, You've right, got two right. clicks. If it's more than that, it's too much. <laughs> that's right. And you know what? I, I revert to something I'm good at, which is metabolic med ball slams. <laughs> uh, and uh, 
that's my toddler experience with gym desk. It makes me a happy toddler. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's great. So where if people want to um, learn more about you, do you have a website or somewhere they can go to uh, yeah, contact they can go, you? Yeah, they can go to d'artagnanbjj.com and uh, it'll take them to the website and they mm-hmm. can just look at that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Cool. Well, I or county jail and go to the visitors area <laughs> and then just say my name and you're there to visit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's my Irish uh, always telling bad jokes at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't ask. That's funny. That <laughs> go to the jail and ask for me. <laughs> yeah, go to the visitor center. Don't go to the intake. Yeah. Visitor center. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for, thank you for coming on and um, I, it'll be awesome to do this again sometime. Yeah, I would really enjoy it. It was uh, uh, much, much less frightening than I had anticipated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, like uh, I went to a tournament and I was crapping myself and then I won my first match and I'm like, oh. Now it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Pod- podcasts yeah, can- are more fun. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh-